Well, good evening, Riverside, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. I hope you have your uh, Bibles with you uh, this evening, and if you would, please turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study uh, of the Beatitudes. And in an earlier session, uh, I mentioned that uh, much of what Jesus taught is a paradox. And this evening's Beatitude uh, provides us with a, a pretty clear example of that. Uh, as he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn. And that just, that sounds so very strange, uh, even as we say it. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. Uh, those two uh, different uh, attitudes, uh, being blessed and mourning, uh, just don't seem to go together. And yet that is exactly what Jesus does. And again, we're, we're taking this word blessed or blessed, uh, however you would like to, to say that, uh, to mean that God looks favorably upon or God looks with favor uh, upon those people who demonstrate these characteristics or these attitudes. And this evening, Jesus is talking about those who mourn. And remember, we suggested that Jesus is providing us with uh, a progression of thought here. And he began this with those who are poor in spirit. And with that expression, Jesus is not talking about uh, people who are living in poverty. He's not, he's not describing uh, people who, who live without uh, material possessions, but he's, he's describing a condition of the heart because that's where it all begins isn't it is at the heart uh, our heart uh, affects us in so many ways it, it really uh, determines who and what we are as a people uh, what what goes into our heart and what is in our heart uh, that's who we're going to be and so Jesus uh, starts at the very root of it. He starts at the heart. Uh, and he, he wants us to, to look at the condition of our heart. And he wants our heart to be poor in spirit. And because that's where it all begins. You recall when Peter preached that first gospel sermon. Uh, what was the response of the people to that sermon? Luke tells us that they were cut to the heart, didn't he? And that's what God wants to see. Uh, that's the kind of response uh, that God is looking for. He, he's looking for people whose hearts have been touched, have been reached by the gospel. And so the next step in this progression of thought then are, is those who mourn. And the word that Jesus is using there that's translated as mourn uh, is not limited to the sadness we may feel uh, at, at the loss of a loved one. And certainly we, ha we all have had uh, that experience of losing a loved one. And certainly it is appropriate at that time uh, that we mourn and, and that we grieve and so it's, it's appropriate at those times. But Jesus is not talking about that kind uh, of, of response. He's talking about really the world. And he's drawing a contrast here. There's an implied contrast here uh, between the typical response of the world and then the, the response that Jesus desires from those who would be his followers. And the world's philosophy of life, if you will, is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. 
And that's generally the, the response of the world. Uh, and it, it's a very flippant, it's, it's a very superficial uh, response or view of life. And, and it's, it's a view of life that basically ignores the reality of sin. And, and, and sin, or the S word, is, is just not a word that we hear uh, very often today, unless we're in some sort of a, a religious setting. And, and even in many of those places, you know, many people don't want to hear uh, the S word. They don't want to hear uh, about sin. And that's precisely the problem that Jesus is addressing in this beatitude. As one author stated, it is one thing to be spiritually poor and acknowledge it. It is another to grieve and to mourn over it. Confession is one thing. Contrition is another. It's interesting that as you look at, at uh, Luke's gospel and Luke's account uh, of the Beatitudes, Luke expresses it this way in chapter 6, and verse 21, Luke writes, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. But then he's, he goes even further uh, with this thought a few verses later, and he draws out this contrast explicitly, saying, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. That's Luke 6. And verse 25. And that's our world, isn't it? That's our world today. The, the world laughs at sin today. The world laughs at the immorality that we see around us today. It, it, it laughs at greed. It laughs at the exaltation of self. It laughs at the abuse of others. That's, that's the world we live in today. And, and perhaps that's the reason why we see low, so little mourning or grieving over sin today. You know, in prior generations, there was support from society over wickedness and, and immorality. It wasn't just members of some religious group grieving over sin, but society in general grieved over sin. And so there was support there. But we're not going to get that support today. As much as we may decry sinfulness today, society in general is not going to support us. In fact, society in general is going to stand against us. And society is going to laugh at sinfulness today. And so we're really going to have to be intentional today about our response to sin, to the sin that we see. There are just too few tears today and too little mourning uh, over sinfulness today. And Jesus issues the warning. He says, the laughter, your laughter today will one day turn to mourning. But that day it'll be too late. And so it is wisdom that mourns now because of sin. And we mourn because of our own sin. We, we grieve over our, our own sin sinfulness. Leslie Thomas, in his little commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, makes the observation, the saddest thing in the world is not a soul that sorrows, but one that is so dull that it is incapable of feeling grief at all. Simply the recognition of sin is not enough. And we see this, I think, in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. You know, we see the young man there who, 
who eventually comes to himself. He comes to his senses and he recognizes his sin. But it's not just the recognition of his sin that drives him back home. It's also his grief, his mourning over his sinfulness, which takes him back to his father. I mean, can, can we see that young man coming back to his father <clears throat> and, and just arrogantly standing before his father and saying something like, well, I guess you were right. I mean, I, I don't see that at all. Do you? How do you see this young man as he comes back to his father? I see him on his knees, maybe even crawling towards his father. On his knees, tears in his eyes, pleading with his father to, to please accept him back, not even as a son, but as one of his slaves. I see him grieving uh, over his sin. James writes of this condition of the soul, this response, when he says in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so it raises the question for you and me, how do we respond to our own sin? Surely we recognize it. But is that all we do? And is that enough? And again, we, we can't depend on society to shame our sin. Society's not going to do that today. Society sees no reason to be shamed today. Do we simply recognize our sin or do we grieve? over it? Do we mourn over our sin? The psalmist wrote this concerning his own sin. Psalm 38, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin, for I'm ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. A few weeks ago, we were looking at the idea of lament, and that's another way that this word uh, that's, that's translated more. And this is another way that word can be translated. It can also be translated as to lament. And so we, we, we lament not just over something which has happened that, that we don't understand and we're asking God to, to, to come in and to intervene, but we can also lament over our sin, over our own sin and also for the sins of others. When we see the sins of others, when we see the sins of the world around us, what is our response to that? Do we just get angry? Or do we, do we feel proud and, and puffed up that we are not as wicked as they are? Or do we mourn and grieve over their sin as well as our own? 
When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, his first letter, he wrote in response to some questions that they had. He also wrote uh, in responding to some problems that he saw in that congregation. And as he addresses a specific issue, he also addresses the Corinthians' response to that issue. And their response is, is not appropriate. And he admonishes them for their inappropriate response to the sinfulness that exists among them. Listen to, to what Paul says here. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And so that's the sin that, that he's writing to address. But notice he, he quickly, he, he just points that out. But then he moves on to their response to that situation. And he says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? And you almost get the sense that their response is just as bad as the sin that he has pointed out among them. And so here's Paul admonishing these, these Corinthians uh, for not demonstrating the very response that Jesus taught in this beatitude so many years before. Paul himself demonstrated uh, the appropriate response to the sins of others when he wrote to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Paul wrote, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have told, I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul felt no pride about these enemies of the cross, as he describes them. He didn't uh, set himself up as, as being some sort of spiritual superior, comparing himself to these, these people. He, he did not joyfully describe their eternal destruction. It says he wept when he saw how these people were living, how they spurned the cross of Christ. He grieved over the sins of these people. Of course, Jesus provides us with the best example when he looked at the city of Jerusalem. As Luke records in Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 41, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace but now they are hidden from your eyes. When Jesus looked at the city, he saw the people, didn't he? And he saw a lost people. He saw a people who had been deceived and misled, and he grieved over it. He mourned. He wept over the city. And so what is, what is our response when, when we likewise see people today who have been deceived and misled and, and they're living lives that, that bring shame to the cross of Christ? What's our response to that? Are, are, we, are we angry? Are we proud? Or are we grieved? James Toll in his little 
booklet on the Beatitudes quotes the 16th century poet John Donne, who wrote these familiar words. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Or if you prefer uh, a more modern prophet, Chris Christopherson wrote a song uh, with these words. What I had called my brother on, now he had every right to call on me. That picker that's in trouble, boy, ain't nothing but another side of you. And both poets got it right, didn't they? Because sin is the great equalizer here. Sin really doesn't care who you are or what you are. It doesn't care how wealthy you may be or how poor you may be. It doesn't care... It doesn't care how well-educated you are or uneducated you are. It doesn't care if you're male or female, old or young. Sin is the great equalizer. It condemns us all. No one has cause for boasting over sin. Except, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin is simply a cause for grieving in anyone and for anyone. God looks with favor upon those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. I'm glad, aren't you, that Jesus did not leave us there in our grief. He makes an assumption. Uh, in that, that those who are grieved, those who mourn uh, about their sin are going to do something about it. And they're going to seek a solution. And Jesus assures them that there is a solution. He is that solution. And this word translated comfort uh, is, is a wonderful word. It is the word parakaleo. Parakaleo. And it carries this idea of earnestly calling for someone, calling someone, pleading for someone to come alongside and provide relief from sorrow or distress. And Jesus is here assuring us in this beatitude, he is going to answer that call. He is going to come to our side. He's going to come to our aid and he is going to provide us uh, with the relief that we need. And it, it, the, the word involves more than just a soothing influence. It's, it's more than just someone, you know, saying there, there, it's going to be okay. But it's a word that also uh, provides, describes this comfort that encourages. It's a comfort that, that comes alongside to hold one up and strengthen it's a comforting which is shared. Paul uh, talks about this in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, th so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. 
You and I live a life and we live in a world that is constantly experiencing failures of one sort or another. And so it may seem as though we are constantly in need of comfort. But the day is coming when the comfort of God will reach its zenith. We can be assured that Jesus is always ready to comfort. As long as we live this life and as long as we live in this world, Jesus is always ready to comfort us. But there's a day coming when his comfort will reach its zenith. And on that day, God tells us he will wipe away every tear. And the cause for mourning, the reason for mourning, will be gone. It will all be over. I thank you for joining me in this study of, of this particular beatitude, which is so very important for us. Maybe something we really need to work on, to mourn and to grieve our sins. Let's close with a word of prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, we love you so, and we recognize our sin. But Father, help us to do more than that. Father, help us to be distressed by our sins. Father, please reshape our hearts. Help our hearts to feel the shame of our sin. Help us to understand, Father, how you feel about our sin. Father, teach us and help us to learn how to mourn our sin. And Father, as we mourn, we plead for your comfort. Come to our side, Father, and lift us up. Help us not to be overwhelmed by our sin, but Father, assure us and strengthen us by your grace and by your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I hope you have a restful evening.